Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Let's all rise. Worship Jesus together. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. He is good. He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing
good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am let's all rise and I've heard a thousand stories of what they Lord Jesus, how humbled we are by the boundless love that you have for each one of us. 
And we want you to know how much we love you, how much we thank you for your sacrifice for us, that you revealed yourself to us, that your word tells us we did not seek you, but you sought us. When we look at our own hearts, Lord, we wonder why you did, but we're so grateful that you did. We're so grateful to be your children. We're grateful for the everlasting, never failing, never leaving or forsaking love that you have for each one of us. We pray that you would fill us with that love and use this time in your word to that end, Lord, that we would learn more of you and be more conformed to your likeness. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Greet someone in the awesome love of Jesus tonight. Well, good evening, folks, and welcome. Uh, we are in Job chapter 7 tonight. I want to mention also to you, uh, I spoke to uh, Frankie uh, Hernandez today. He still has some residual effects from his, uh, his event that uh, uh, took place there. And, uh, but he's very appreciative of the prayers and uh, being just held up, so... Uh, he's not back to work yet, and um, so just continue to, to hold him up, and we'll praise the Lord for, uh, for an answer to prayer there, and uh, just another one of those little medical miracles, amen. Uh, let's pray. Father, we bless you as we, once again this week, come, Lord, to this book of Job. Lord, how we pray that as we look at this man who is so severely tested, Lord, uh, having lost just, just everything, and yet, Lord, uh, uh, he clung in, in faith to you. In, in the face of, Lord, rejection, criticism, Lord, judgmental attitudes. And Lord, we, uh, we're thankful, Lord, for the example that we find in this man's life. That uh, we only hope, Lord, that as we face our trials, that, uh, Lord, we would pass the test, that we wouldn't, Lord, uh, cave in, Lord, um, to all the circumstances, and certainly if, if anyone, Lord, uh, should have caved in, it should have been Jove. So we thank you, Lord, for the example, the illustration Lord, of, of faith under fire. And Lord, um, we realize that, uh, Lord, we, uh, at this time, the, the church at large is being tested. And Lord, uh, there will be fiery trials ahead, Lord, for, for your people. So help us, Lord, we pray that these studies and any study of the Bible Lord, would not just be some academic practice, but there would be a reality, Lord, that as we receive these things, Lord, into our hearts and lives, that, Lord, there would be, Lord, uh, the reality of them being lived out. Lord, not just touted, not just, Lord, uh, spoken uh, in a light kind of way, but that, Lord, your word would, would take root in our hearts, in our lives. For, Lord, we realize that that is, Lord, the buttress 
Lord, we've been given the word, we've been given truth. Uh, it's a buttress for all that this life and all that this world may throw at us. And we realize, Lord, as your people that in many instances, Lord, we become singled out because we do belong to you. And Lord, you, you allow that. Lord, that our faith might be, Lord, strengthened and, and deepened. And that, Lord, the end of it all, that you would be glorified. And that you would be pleased. You said, without faith, it's impossible to please you. We want to live a life, Lord, that's pleasing, that's honoring Jesus Christ. And we realize, Lord, that takes place. Lord, when, uh, Lord, when uh, we're put into the trial, Lord, when we're in the fire, when we're in the crucible, Lord, help us, we pray, Father, to be Christians then. Lord, not just in word only, Lord, but in deed and truth. I thank you for those that are here tonight, Father. And Lord, um, we ask you to bless your word as we, we open it once again. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so we're in chapter 7. <clears throat> just want to pick up uh, kind of where we were last week. Uh, verse 7 of chapter uh, 11. <clears throat> And Job is speaking here in this particular chapter. And one of the things that it's important, I think, for him to realize, and I think a lot of times we tend to realize these things after we experience them, after we go through them. Hopefully we do. We hope we're, hopefully we're learning. Um, we're benefiting from even our failures. That, that's, the, that's the grace of God that we can you know, be enriched and, and even benefit you know, by the by the setbacks, by the, by the failures, we can learn from them. Uh, we, we, you know, certainly we learn you know, as we trust him. That's a glorious thing, but sometimes uh, we forget that um, you know, in, our, in the mistakes, in, in the errors, uh, the Lord has a wonderful way of using them sometimes to just really get our attention um, and to just maybe have us double down with a, with a, greater, sense, a greater sense of resolve and determination that I'm not going to fail again in that area, you know. Maybe perhaps it's been an area that where there's been a repeat of failure, you know, within our lives, within our experience. And I think we can get to a point finally where we say, well, this, that, you know, by the grace of God, I'm not going to let that happen again. Uh, and even though it may happen again, at least there's resolve, there's, there's a determination uh, you know, there's a breaking through the things that perhaps maybe once held us. So uh, we're going to pick it up in verse 11. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. And the thing about complaining, we have to be careful with it. Uh, sometimes we can complain a little too much. Uh, one of the things I am thankful for as I see Job's complaint is here's a godly man complaining, <laughs> you know. Uh, and I tell you what, there's no better place to make your complaint, not to your neighbor, okay, but to the Lord, amen. Uh, make our case to him, you know, you know, bring it before him. Sometimes you see, you know, some of the things that a prophet might say, you know, I think it was Jeremiah says, I'm not going to speak anymore in your name, you know, kind of a thing. He's just, he, he's tired of the rejection and, and all of that that prophet, prophets had to face. And, but at least he's saying it to the Lord. No doubt, uh, sometimes, you know, we have to sometimes, you know, get that thing out there, you know, have our little catharsis and, you know, kind of get it out of the way and, and sometimes when we do that, we realize, you know, that uh, that's maybe not the way to go kind of a thing. But sometimes we just need to, we need to, we need to do that. And we see Job doing that here. And, um, you know, sometimes they think, we, we think that sainthood is absolute perfection. Well, it is not. Uh, it is anything but perfection. But it's the grace of God just, you know, working in the lives of sinners, you know, people who... You know, we, we have uh, all kinds of, you know, all kinds of issues of life that we're working through, and that's why we have an awesome and wonderful God. He is so patient, He is so gracious, He is so loving um, as He deals with us in our situation. He says, am I a sea or a sea serpent? I think one translation says a sea monster, that you set a guard over me. And you know, it's like, what do you think? I, I, you know, uh, are you like a prison guard standing watch over me kind of a thing? Uh, and he feels like that. He feels like that no matter what he does. Um, he feels like he's being chastened, he's being beat up. And no doubt, there, there's a thing here 
uh, that's important that sometimes it's kind of, it's a, there's a silence about it, uh, but we have, to, we have to remember that there's a spiritual war going on here. There, and we are involved also, too, in, a, in spiritual warfare. And no doubt the enemy is just trying to just discourage this guy, defeat this guy. Because remember, uh, he wants to destroy Job. He wants to destroy Job. Look at those uh, kind of debates, you know, between, you know, between him, and, him and the Lord. You know, if you do this, he's going to curse you, you know, to his face, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And he, Job is just simply a mercenary. So he wants to destroy Job in any possible way uh, that he can, just simply to get to God. And, and somehow, if the devil in any way can prove God to be wrong, uh, he's going to try to do that. And so Job basically is the football here. He, he's the one, the target, if you will, that Satan wants to destroy so he can basically go back to God and say, see, look at this guy. You know, you were saying he was blameless and he was upright um, in, in, in all these things. And look, he's just, you know, he's just, you know, he, look how quickly he fell apart. And of course, that's not the case here. He says, <clears throat> when I say my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint. Then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with, with visions. Uh, and of course, this is, you know, if the Lord gives you a, vi- a dream or a vision, you know, it's going to be instructive. It's going to give you direction. And it got it, the Lord ain't going to give you a nightmare. Uh, I think, you know, if there's anybody that's going to give us a nightmare, it's the devil, okay? Um, and maybe just to somehow attack our thought life or whatever the case may be in the vulnerability, you know, of being, being asleep. He says, so that my soul chooses strangling. He, he has, he's in such misery, he kind of has a fixation almost, you know, on death in the sense that he just wants to be dead. And you know, as you look at what happened to the guy, I mean, who could blame him? He just, you know, in a sense... Uh, I imagine, too, that there are people that come into such misery in their life, they're thinking, you know what, it, it would just be easier if I died. It'd just be easier to just end this misery, to end this emotional pain or physical pain, whatever the case may be. And Job is at that place. He, he is at that place. And I think, you know, anybody uh, who's ever committed suicide is at that, at that very same place, although Job is not suggesting that. Um, you know, he's trusting God, you know, in the face of all this, but he's at that place where he just, in a sense, God, you want to take me out of here? It's, it's okay uh, with me. He says, uh, and death, he would choose death rather than my body, or another translation would be uh, rather than uh, death rather than life. He says, I loathe or I hate my life. In other words, he hates it now, uh, certainly, he's had a good life up to this point. God has blessed him in such an incredible way. But we're like that. You know, sometimes, you know, when we're, when we're in a place of, you know, you know perhaps uh, spiritual warfare, we're getting beat up by circumstances in life, we tend to forget about all the good things the Lord did. We tend to forget about the blessings and all that sort of thing. And uh, we were kind of praying in there tonight uh, before we came out, and, and we were saying, you know, if the Lord just took us, took us all right now and put us in prison for the rest of our life, we can be thankful for all that he's done thus far. He's been so incredibly, awesomely good to us and so kind to us, but we tend to forget that. We tend to forget that according to present, you know, circumstances and, and situations. He says, I would not live. I, would, I don't want to live forever, but Job, you're going to live forever. And he says, let me alone. And perhaps he's speaking here to the council, you know, of his friends. You know, the, you know, they're lining up. It's almost like a tag team, you know. Okay, here's Zophar. Boom, boom. Here's Bildad. Boom, boom. Here's Eliphaz. Boom. And then there comes another guy later, El- Elihu. And uh, I mean, they're just kind of they're hammering on this guy uh, in a certain kind of way. And he said, let me alone, you know, kind of a thing. He's, he's, he's just so fed up with, with all of this. He's deepened in his grief. For my days are but a breath. What is man that you should exalt him, that you should set uh, your heart upon, upon him? So verses 20, 17 rather through 21, uh, he speaks directly to God. It's, it sounds like he's agitated. He sounds frustrated with it. But, but he's letting off the steam in a sense, you know, to the Lord, you know, relative to this whole thing. He says, you set your heart on him. Uh, that you should visit him every morning. And remember this, God does set his heart on us, but it's for good. Now he's thinking, you set your heart on me for evil. Because he's a target. He is a target. There's no doubt about it. Um, and, and he's seeing everything that happens to him, you know, it's God's fault. You know, or, or maybe even, 
maybe even the fact that, that he sees, he understands God's sovereignty, that you know, even though if he didn't believe God was doing it directly, God, you let this happen to me. I always remember a story that Margie told me. She took one of our little boys uh, to the to the doctors many years ago for a for a for a inoculation, you know, one of the vaccines that you get when you're just a little kid, and and he was just of that age where you know he wasn't really uh, talking. Uh, in full sentences and that sort of thing, and the doc and, and Margie's holding him, and the doctor there gives him his little shot and his little uh, inoculation, and man, he started crying, and he looked at Margie and he said, "You let, you let. In other words, you let that man hurt me. You let that man stick me. You know, with that nasty old. You let that. And I think Job's at that kind of blue. You let, you let that happen. You know, to me." Uh, you know, you're my God. You're, you're, the one, you're the one who loves me. You're the one who, who uh, has, uh, you know, blessed my life so far. Why are you leaving these kind of things happen to me? Uh, he says uh, that you should visit him every morning and test him every, every moment. And, and so he kind of feels like, God, you're picking on me on a little bit unfairly. You know, every moment you're, you're testing me. And he goes on in verse 19, how long? How long will you not... Uh, look away from me. And now he says directly to the Lord, let me alone till I swallow uh, my saliva. So it's the second time he said that. And, and it's again as if he's gazing up to God and just in frustration. Maybe, maybe there's, a, there's some angst here. You know, let me alone. You know, why is it? And, and now, obviously, it does seem in Job's life it's wave after wave. Have you ever had events like that in your life? Sometimes it just seems like, you know, like waves, they kind of come in, they just keep coming in with regularity, you know, upon your life. And certainly Job is in that kind of place, and he just kind of, he's just screaming and crying out, let me alone. Again, he wants to die. And he says here in verse 20, have I sinned? In other words, if I have sinned without knowing it, is there something that I have done that I'm really not aware of? <clears throat> and he says, what have I done to you, uh, O watcher, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target? So as he searches his heart, uh, you know, wondering basically, you know, if he has sinned or not and wonders if I have sinned, God, why haven't you pardoned me? And, and he feels like a target. He feels like God's just this archer, you know, just at one arrow after another, you know, into him. So that I am a burden to myself. Why then do you not pardon my transgression and put away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust, and you will seek me diligently, but I will no longer be. So he's ready. He's just basically ready to lie down uh, and die in this situation, in this circumstance. So here in verse chapter 8 uh, comes Bildad. Uh, he's one of his friends. Uh, he has sat there. He has listened to Job. He has listened to Eliphaz. Uh, Job's complaint, and he believes perhaps that his counsel is going to be the thing that settles, the, settles it. Uh, you know, sometimes I've seen guys when sometimes you get in a circle and there's a, there's a very um, brisk conversation. You can just see the guys are loading up. They're loading up. They're getting ready. They're getting ready to chime in, and they're going to they're going to make sure that their opinion uh, is going to be the better opinion of the whole thing. And maybe they're even going to maybe criticize somebody that spoke before them. You know, kind of thing. I don't know if you've ever been in that one of those kind of circles. Um, and, and these guys here are basically, these guys, they're godly men. Uh, they're, they're sharing many things that are absolutely true. But like we've said before, they're misguided. They're, they're misdirected. They're misapplied uh, upon Job's life. And so here's Bill, Bill Dad. Um, and uh, he's a shoe height. Somebody said he's the shortest guy in the Bible. <laughs> I'm sorry, I that, that, that had to say it. Uh, he answered and he said, How long will you speak these things? And the words of your mouth like a strong wind. In other words, Job, you're a, you're a, you're a windbag. And, uh, and, and of course, it was, it was complaining and griping that Job was doing. But um, to call him a windbag, I mean, it's really not to even give God, the guy any space. You know, in his situation, I mean, look what all's happened to him. You know, give him some grace here, Job. You're a windbag. Now, now <clears throat> the problem of being here, uh, he, well, he says here, does God subvert judgment? Well, of course, no. 
Does the Almighty pervert justice? No. But the problem is, as they assess the situation, look at Job, this is not justice from God. God already justified Job in the sense that said he's upright and blameless. You know, the, 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 you know, the number one guy in this whole part of the world kind of a thing. So, so this is not justice from God. They're assuming it is. They're assuming that, that all this, this, this series of horrific events happening to this man, this has to be divine judgment. This can be nothing less. They were so absolutely convinced. I think sometimes we have to be careful. You know, when we are so strongly convinced, you know, about, you know, certain things. Because you discover, man, if you walk with the Lord for any length of time, you can be so wrong. You can be so utterly, so absolutely wrong about so many things. And that's why it's so important to stop, to pray, you know, look to God, you know, for discernment. You know, be, be swift to hear, slow to speak. And even slower to get angry, you know, about circumstances and situations. He says, now, if your sons have sinned against me, uh, now, now, he's maybe, in a sense, lightening a little bit more so than Eliphaz, because Eliphaz basically said, you know, um, you know, it's probably your fault that you're, you're, you know, all your family's wiped out, you know, kind of a thing. So he's making saying, well, if your sons have sinned, and of course, uh, we have no indication of that at all. Uh, uh, he has cast them away for their transgression. And if you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty. Now again, his theology here and has a, a measure of truth, but again, the, the application is, is, is off. If you would earnestly seek God, make your supplication to the Almighty. If you were pure and upright, surely now he would awake for you. And prosper your rightful dwelling place. To me, you know, it sounds like too many ifs. It's too iffy. And though your beginning was small, yet your latter end uh, would increase uh, abundantly. For inquire, please, of the former age, um, and consider the things discovered by their fathers. For we were born yesterday and know nothing. Because our days on earth are a shadow. Uh, will they not teach you and tell you and utter, utter words uh, from their heart? Now, certainly it's true that we can learn certain things from past generations. There, there, there's wisdom. I think sometimes uh, n you know, newer generations of people tend to throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. But again, too, there's a lot of mistakes that, that future, or excuse me, past generations make. Um, and also, too, we can learn from those mistakes. Uh, and I think, I, think it's, I think one of the things uh, that's sad that's going on in public education in America today is this erasure of history. Um, uh, and, and there's good history, there's bad history. But you know what? We can learn from that. Uh, instead of just erasing the whole thing and just... And, and the other thing, too, you know, I, I think you know, any, anybody's capable of this, but when sometimes you look at a situation of just sort of painting it with a broad brush, um, without discerning between all the different nuances and, and, and situations. Like, uh, some people just, they'll write off an entire generation. They'll just write off an entire generation of people because something negative happened uh, in that particular generation at that particular time point. And that's stupid. That, that, that's really, that's, that's wrong. And it's, it has a lot to do with pride and self-righteousness. Uh, and, and certainly we have learned so much more um, in, in our present-day generation than maybe the generations of our parents or grandparents. But I'll tell you what, there's in so many ways, in so many areas, we stand on their shoulders. We stand on their, you know, Veterans Day tomorrow. We, we, this country stands, in a sense, because of the sacrifices of many people. Listen, Europe's free today because Americans in two different wars went over there to fight and liberate you know, that particular part of the world. Japan is free today. The Asia, part of that part of Asia, you know, because of, you know, when you think of the, basically the cost uh, of American lives. Uh, it was, you know, I, I'm kind of a little bit of a history buff about these kinds of things. And when you think about, you know, cost one, you know what it cost? You know how many Marines died in one, in, in one island campaign? One island. Iwo Jima. 6,800 Marines died 
in one island. Okinawa was, was over 10,000 and triple that in wounded. Um, and so I, 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 you know, I, I think it's important that we recognize uh, the successes and, the, and basically the sacrifices of those that have gone. You think about you know, our parents. Think about our parents, our grandparents. You know, what, what, you know, what it cost them to leave their family of origin, to emigrate, you know, to America, uh, to basically start all over again. Uh, I think about, you know, I grew up with my grandparents. It's kind of funny because uh, I'm connected to that generation. They were both born in the 1890s. And in the course of their lifetime, in the course of their lifetime, um, they saw the invention, you know, basically of the, the I think, the light bulb, the telegraph, uh, World War I, uh, the Depression, World War II, uh, Korea. Um, basically, you go from a biplane, when my, when my grandma was a teenager, to a jet, this fighter jet in the 1960s that can fly 400, 500 miles an hour. And at the end of the 1960s, you got somebody on the moon, all in one lifetime. Incredible. And yet they were so old school. They, they were so old school, they never had a car in their life. And, and I can remember my grandmother, you know, they're, they're, I remember their entire lifetime savings, $600. That was it, $600, their entire. And, and yet they were, they were kind, they were gracious, they were generous. You know, they were like so many people. Um, and, and yes, people, you can malign, you know, look at, you know, that, you know, that whole generation. It's like, it's like, you know, we, we see that so often just, you know, in our culture, just again, maligning and painting everything with a broad brush and realizing that, you know, the people that have gone before us for generations, so many of these people were just the salt of the earth, hard working people. They worked, they lived, they worked, uh, they sacrificed for their families, they, they died. And, um, and we stand on their shoulders. And we need to be thankful. We, we need to be appreciative. We need to be thankful. Um, and we need to remember that instead of just trying to erase, you know, erase all of our, you know, all of our history and just write everybody off as, yeah, they were all this, they were all that. that that's so ignorant. That is so utterly ignorant of, um, of the cultures and the generations that have, uh, that have gone before us. <clears throat> Now he goes on to say here, uh, will they not teach you and tell you and utter words from their heart? Can the papyrus grow up without a marsh? Now he's going to use uh, nature basically to illustrate uh, his particular wisdom in this situation. So can the papyrus, uh, a, a, you know, basically a, a marsh uh, plant, grow up without, without a marsh or without water? Can the reeds flourish without water? No, they need water. And while it is yet green and not cut down, it withers before any other plant. Uh, so, so Job, you're green, but now you're withering. You, you were green at one point in your life, and now you're just simply withering. Uh, no doubt you have forgotten God, and, and, uh, and there's no hope in your double life. There's no hope in your hypocrisy. That's what they're, they're just basically saying, Job, you're two-faced. You're, you've been leading a double life. That's why all of this has happened. That's what hypocrisy is. Hypocrisy is just basically living a double life. And um, so are the paths of all who forget God, and the hope of the hypocrite shall perish, uh, whose confidence shall be cut off, and whose trust is a spider's web. Not true indeed, no doubt about that, but not true for Job. <laughs> he leans on his house, but it does not stand, speaking about the, uh, the spider's web. He holds it fast, but it does not endure. He grows green in the sun, and his branches spread out in his garden. Uh, his roots wrap around the rock, uh, the rock heap, and, and they look for a place uh, in the stones. Uh, and if he is destroyed from his place, then it shall deny him, saying, uh, I have not seen you. So basically, Job, uh, you know, you're that garden, you're destroyed, and nobody's going to know anything. You're just going to be. And I imagine, too, that here they're ministering to this guy. He's at, he's at the dump. He's at the ash heap. He's got uh, these pussy boils all over him. Uh, his wife has told him to curse God and die. Everything he's, ha everything he's had in his life is just simply gone. Um, 
And, uh, and so they're thinking, you know, this is it. This is it, Job. You're like that garden. You're, just, you're withered. Uh, you're destroyed. And, and um, what encouragement, huh? <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, let him come up for air, will you? Give the, give the guy a break. See, behold, this is the joy of his way. For out of the earth others will grow. Or in other words, others are just going to replace you. They're going to come along, Job, and not even know that you were there. This used to be Job's Well, Who's Job, you know? Well, yeah, he was a guy that, you know, he lived in this place, and he had a big spread and herds and all that and a big family, and, and, and God just wiped him right out, you know, just like that. And, and, and here's the property. You can buy it, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, nor will he uphold uh, the evildoers. Uh, he will yet fill your mouth with laughing, your lips with rejoicing, and those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked will come uh, to nothing. So again here, uh, there's truth, there's no doubt about that, but again, he, he's insinuating that Job is simply far uh, from ne- being blameless, and Job, you know what, buddy, you just need to admit it. You need to admit it, but Job can't admit it. What, what, if he admits it, he's admitting something that was simply not true. Um, but again, here they, are, here they are, and they're preaching. This is their platform. They're preaching to Job. And sometimes, you know, preaching can be like that. Preaching can be truth, but at the same time, utterly insensitive. It's one of the things I pray about. I, don't want, I want to just get on some kind of hobby horse, um, and, uh, and just be preaching, you know. I remember one time, many years ago, we had just moved to Florida. And we went to a Bible church, went to a, a you know, Bible church. I, I won't tell you the name of the denomination, don't need to. But uh, the, the preacher, his message was so hard and insensitive. It just hurt your spirit. It just hurt your spirit. And I felt so sad because the man was trying to be Billy Graham or somebody else. Um, he was just simply, he, he just simply was not being himself. And, uh, and, and, and because we weren't used to this kind of, this kind of preaching, um, that, that as we came into that environment, it's like, oh, this is toxic. And you've, your heart goes out, you know. Uh, your heart goes out to the preacher. Your heart goes out to the people. Um, and, and this is what's taking place here. They're, they're, they're preaching. They're, they're saying things that are true. But sometimes you can take truth and, and use it in the, apply it in the wrong kind of way. And it can be so, it could be hurtful to someone. That's why it's so important that um, I think for preachers or for any of us, because, you know, the fact of the matter, whether we're, you know, whether we're, we're counseling or preaching, we're, we're still doing the same thing. Preaching is speaking to many different people. Counseling is just maybe doing a one-on-one thing. I think it's important that we pray. I, I think that we pray and get the mind of the Lord. Um, this is something, you know, that uh, um, many years ago the Lord just really showed me as I began to get into counseling and, 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 and spending time with folks and letting them, you know, air their you know, situation, their problem. I, I wanted to be on target. I just wanted, I didn't want to, you know, just jump onto some kind of, you know, some little tangent. Um, you know, sometimes you can pick up one little thing and you go off in this rabbit trail, you know, just that one little thing you pick up rather than, you know, just waiting and listening to the whole story and the whole situation. And uh, so often when I counsel, and I would recommend if you do it too, if you're counseling, with, counseling someone or you're listening to someone, be praying be praying as they're maybe sharing and bearing their heart that you could say something. And sometimes, you know what, quite honestly, it would be better for these guys to say nothing. (laughs) It would have been better for them to say nothing than to beat up on the guy. Uh, And I'm sure they went away going, you know, I just spoke some truth, man, to Job. And let's just see what he's going to do with it. Uh, kind of a thing. They probably went away just feeling, you know, like, man, you know, I've brought those scriptures up with recall and oh, hallelujah, you know, kind of a thing. And, and men are so far off. They're just so far off the mark. So we're in chapter nine here. <clears throat> Job is going to answer a bill dad here. Uh, one of the questions that's being debated here is the justice of God. Uh, we know God is just. There's, there's no doubt about it. But sometimes 
you know, the people's apprehension of the justice of God, um, you know, can be, you know, can be skewed. Um, like, for instance, you know, somebody, you know, sometimes <laughs> a, a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. You know, when it comes to, you know, Bible knowledge, you know, Paul says that and he says, you know, knowledge puffeth up, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, so we need wisdom, you know, with our knowledge. And, um, and sometimes, you know, we can we can just say things, you know, just in the wrong in the wrong kind of spirit because our apprehension, our perspective, you know, on it. Like, for instance, if I were to go if I were to go um, down Main Street in Rochester and I just start preaching hellfire and brimstone. Okay, and start telling people they're going to hell. Well, that you know what? That may be very true, but is that the approach? I don't think that's the approach. Okay, I think I think when you have, tr yeah, it's it's important to have truth, but it's also important to have wisdom. What we need the the wisdom and the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit. If we're gonna, you know, if the truth we have is going to meet its mark, if it's going to, you know, have any kind of you know positive impact and really counsel people. Uh, you know, in a particular situation. So also, too, in chapter 9, uh, uh, he's hoping to have his day in court, you know, with God. Uh, he wants to give his defense, man. He wants, to, he wants to vindicate himself because he's not only being accused by his friends, he's being accused by the devil. The, the, the devil's behind all this at the same time, too, trying to beat him down and condemn him, uh, even hammer him, in a sense, with truth, from, from, from his, you know, his, his friends. <laughs> he, and Job answered and said, Truly I know it is so, but how can a man be righteous before God? Well, we, we can't be. <laughs> Not in and of ourself. We, we, we kind of, we, we touch on that, don't we? Uh, oftentimes in other studies, that, that we, our righteousness is an imparted, an imputed, uh, given to us uh, in you know, here you are, here's a person, they're just saved out of the most horrific, sinful, criminal background. That day, they asked Jesus in their heart, they're righteous. And it wasn't because, well, I cleaned up my act. You can't. You can't. And that's what sanctification is. It's God saying, for the rest of your life, I'm cleaning up your act. <laughs> and that's why we have to let them, right? We have to allow him, we have to allow him to, to work in our lives. And, you know, as we, we kind of, we talking about maybe it was it last Sunday, you know, and when I clean up my act, then I'll come to church. You know, well, you're never going to clean your act up. That's the problem. And, and maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe that's a, a, a psychology behind it, you know. I can't get cleaned up, so I'm not going to church, you know, kind of a thing. But again, his righteousness is so, so different than, than, uh, than self-righteousness. <clears throat> so, he says, if one wished to contend with him, that is with God, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. So as he's thinking about, you know, going to court and vindicating himself, he be, it's a sort of a realization as he begins to think this thing through that, you know, uh, even if I were to, to, you know, how could I answer him one time really out of a thousand, you know? How can I prove my innocence, you know, before him? He's kind of, it's a, it's sort of, he's, he's kind of frustrated about it. Uh, God is wise, he says in verse 4, and he's mighty uh, in strength. He's, he's, his meditations are God, and God are simply causing him here to reflect on the attributes of God. And that's why it's important, I think, that we meditate. Me meditation, biblical meditation, let me tell you folks today, it's a lost ark. Ark, yeah, lost ark. Art. It is. You know why? We have too many distractions. We are so incredibly, utterly distracted. If it ain't the TV, it's the radio. If it ain't that, it's our phone. It's always something that, that just sort of um, grabs our attention. And, and biblical meditation is important. We, we, we need to have that. We see that. We see it so encouraged you know, you know, in the Bible, what Paul says over in Philippians chapter 4 there, he says, when he says in the, in the older translations, think on these things. In the newer translations, it's meditate meditate on these things. And that's what brings, again, uh, rooting and grounding, you know, in our life. And we need to do that. Uh, you know, no, no sooner am I uh, awake, 
you know, early and get up early in the morning to get down there and pray and get with my Bible. And man, boom, boom, I hear, I hear the things coming into my phone. I hear boop, 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 boop. You know, it's like, and, and it's, like the, it's like the tyranny of the urgent. Is there something important? I need to pick that thing up. You know, it's like it's always beckoning to you to grab your attention. And, and sometimes, you know, you just need to turn it off. Um, I, heard, I heard of a businessman one time. He says, you know what? When I leave work and I go home, I turn my phone off. It's a wise man. And some, you know, if, if you're not going to, if you're not going to turn off the distraction for your life, God can't do it for you. That, that's one of the disciplines of the spiritual life that you and I have to have to shut things off that are just constantly, you know, trying to grab our attention and pull our attention. And they're not wicked, awful things. They're many legitimate things. But we need to learn how to meditate. I'll tell you what, it'll bring a tremendous amount of clarity and, and insight into our lives when we just take time and we open that Bible, and we, we meditate, and we think about the, 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 the Word of God, and in our particular life, in our particular situation, the entrance of thy Word, O Lord, giveth light. It gives understanding to the simple. And I want to tell you what, without God's knowledge and wisdom in our life, we are simpletons. I don't care, how, I don't care what your IQ is. Without His insight, without His light, without His wisdom, without His knowledge, we are simpletons. And Satan will very quickly take advantage of us. We need to meditate. We need that truth, you know, getting, you know, buried and, and penetrated, you know, into our hearts, uh, into our lives. So God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has hardened himself against him and prospered? You know, it, it, it's, it's foolish and silly when someone gets, and people do this all the time, they get hardened against the Lord. Circumstances happen in their life. Things that happen that they don't like. Painful things take place. And they're mad at God. I have over, over you know, as, in, as my, in my tenure as a pastor over 40 years, I have seen so many people harden and leave church, leave the fellowship of God's people. And when they harden against God, they're leaving him. No, I'm not saying he's abandoning them. But that hardness is foolishness. It, it, it's silly. We, we have to be able to work through those things. That's what we see Job here. And Job, to me, is the, is the, is the example to the nth degree of everything that, that came against this guy could come against this guy. It did. And yet... Man, he, he, he hung in there. Was, it, was, 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 was Job tempted to harden himself? Oh, yeah. And none of us would even you know, criticize him for it, all that happened. So God is wise in heart, mighty in strength, who has hardened himself against him and prospered nobody. When we harden ourselves, we hurt ourselves. He removes the mountains. They do not know. He overturns them uh, in his anger. Uh, he shakes the earth out of its place, its pillars, temples. So uh, in verses 5 and 6, possibly, he, is this, this is probably a reference here to the flood. That God, you know, a flood can remove a mountain in an instant. How quickly how the topography of the of the uh, you know the, the surface of the earth how it's so drastically radically changed after the flood totally different place than what it was before you got these massive mountain ranges you got these trenches you know down in the ocean <clears throat> he can do that he's as, as job is saying here uh, he he's mighty you you wonder what it would take on the richter scale to to destroy like new york city or L.A. or Chicago. What would it take on the Richter scale? Probably not that much. If God wanted to do that. He's so gracious, isn't he? He shakes the earth out of its place. Its pillars tremble. He commands the sun 
does not rise. He seals off the stars. You know, he obscures the sun, the stars with clouds and, or an eclipse. He alone spreads out the heavens. Uh, it's very possible here when, when he says that, um, that uh, Job is implying that there's an expand, and that's what, that's what science is telling us. We have an expanding universe. Um, it says uh, over in uh, Isaiah 40, Psalm 104, that he spreads out the heavens like a curtain. And we have just, not too long ago, discovered, well, I think maybe it was through the Hubble, that the, expand, that the, the universe is expanding. Uh, science also tells us, tells us right now it's been slowing down a little bit of late. And... Uh, he treads on the waves of the sea. You know, unknowing to him, this is prophetic of Christ. You know, know, what I, know what I love about this? Here's a godly man, and even in his complaint, he's prophesying. <laughs> even in his complaint, he is speaking the word of God, you know, in, in this situation. gives hope to us all, doesn't it? He treads on the waves of the sea. <clears throat> I imagine Job stood, a, you know, he, he looked from Abraham's bosom there to see the Lord walking on the sea there in the Sea of Galilee and say, oh yeah, I remember I said that. I said that back in chapter 9, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, he made the bear, <clears throat> uh, referred to as Arctur Arcturus, and Orion and Pleiades and the chambers of the south. In other words, his, his creative uh, ability fashioned all this, these stars, uh, these constellations, and they had even been named back in Job's day. You know, so we, we, we so oftentimes categorize these people as Neanderthal, you know, Cro-Magnon man and that sort of thing. No, these ancients, these ancients, they're closer to the creation than we are today. And I think as a result of that, these, these, these were brilliant. These were genius individuals. And as far as why, is it, why wasn't there technology there? Because it wasn't time. Um, you know, Daniel, you know, the, prop, the, the Bible speaks about, you know, prophetically there would come times where, um, you know, the, knowledge would increase and there would be technology and those sorts of things. But these ancient people, these were brilliant. Could you, can you write what Job wrote? Can you do that? Uh, look at Adam. He named the entire animal kingdom. I mean, I find it hard just naming one of those strange-looking things, you know. <clears throat> I have a good buddy, and uh, he, takes, he takes safaris to Africa um, every year. And he's been asking me for the last couple of years. He says, come on, I want you to go. Let's, oh, you're going to love it, you know, kind of a thing. And, and I'm really back, and I'm kind of, I'm not sure. Um, if I go, I'm going to try to, uh, I got a, I got a good camera and I really want to, I really want to make it a good photo safari. And, um, I, you know, actually some of those animals are so beautiful. I don't want to shoot those animals, you know, <laughs> kind of a thing. And, um, so, but anyway, he does great things past finding out. Now, Paul picks up on this, this verse here. We find it where? Over in Romans. Romans chapter 11, verse 33, and basically applies it to Israel and how God has a future plan uh, of repentance and restoration for his people. God's ways are past finding out. Because remember, in 9, 10, and 11 of, of uh, um, uh, Romans there, he's reminding the Gentile church, remember there? He says, don't get lifted up in pride thinking, you know, I'm finished with them and you're the cat's meow and all that kind of thing. Um, and, and so he prophesies, you know, this over in, uh, um, you know, 1133. It's such a, a, a great prophecy there. But, he, you know, he does things that are past finding out. And, um, you know, the thing is, you know, about God is there's always going to be a mystery about him. You know what? Because we know certain things about him, but he is so unknowable. That's what we're going to be doing for eternity. Okay? We are going to be getting to know him and love him and experiencing him. See, Jesus is the center point of heaven. And it's even hard for us to, to fully apprehend or explain what heaven is going to be like. 
but he's going to be the center point. Getting to know him, to be around him. I mean, it is going to be just such an incredible, awesome thing. He does great things past finding out. Yes, wonders, miracles without number. And if he goes by me, I do not see him. If he moves past, I do not perceive him. If he takes away, who can hinder him? And who can say to him, what are you doing? I so often remember that in the King James, you know. Who can say to him, what doest thou? You know, uh, because why? He's the Lord. You know, he's God. He does whatever he wants to do. He doesn't ask our permission. <laughs> you know what? I'm glad he doesn't. But you know, he won't force you to do something against your will. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Because sometimes our wills are really stupid. Somebody said you can't fix stupid. You know what? I'm thankful that I know the God who can. <laughs> because he's fixed me many a times. <clears throat> so if he takes away who can hinder him, who can say to him, what are you doing? So he's not only invisible, he's invincible, he's impregnable. And like that song we sing, we sing who can stop the Almighty? You know, thank God for that. God will not withdraw his anger. The allies of the proud lie prostrate uh, beneath them. So when you think about it, no one on this earth has ever faced the full force and anger of God. I mean, he could va you know he could just vaporize the galaxy like that. <laughs> He's so powerful. But aren't you thankful that you know about his attributes of love and kindness and goodness, and faithfulness. I, 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 I ponder those kind of things. I'm so thankful that he's a God of love because what about if he was a God of hate? And he just loved torturing little human beings. We know a God like that. The God of the sage, right? Satan. He does. He does. That's his ultimate purpose, is to torture and destroy humanity, because God created it. And in this weak, sinful, failed humanity, in the face of all those things, we can glorify God. And he, the devil hates that. And humanity is the target, just like in a sense Job is the target to try to destroy this glorious, incredible thing that God has done by creating us and giving us life. How then can I answer him, <clears throat> Job says, and choose my words to reason with him? For though I were righteous, I could not answer him. I would beg mercy of my judge. Man, that's the perfect answer, Job. Man, asking for mercy. Never, never tell God, God, give me what I deserve. <laughs> you, you don't want to do that. So again, if this meeting in court were to happen, he is saying basically, what would I say? How can I reason with him? Even if my cause is righteous, it's, a, it's kind of coming to him in a, in a sort of an epiphanal, uh, revelatory kind of a way as he sort of works through this. You know, what could I really say? How can I reason with God? How can I be just before him? And so though I were righteous, I couldn't answer him. So I would beg for mercy. And if I called and he answered me, <laughs> I would not believe that he, has been, he was even listening to my voice. Can you imagine if you were praying and all of a sudden you're praying, you're talking to God, maybe just unburdening your heart, and all of a sudden there's the Lord speaking to you in an audible voice. It's never happened to me. That's why I think it would be a shock. <laughs> you know? <laughs> For he crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause. He will not allow me to catch my breath. Now, once again, he is he's despairing. He's absolutely discouraged and thinking 
He's thinking that God wants to crush him with a tempest, but it's the devil that wants to destroy this guy. Uh, if God is for me, who can be against me? Uh, we're told in Romans chapter 8. And God is for Job. But again, this test has to come. God does test the righteous. If you're righteous in Christ, and you are, and if you have faith, it's going to be tested. And we don't have to be fearful about that. He will not give you more than you can bear. So many people run from God because they're afraid what God might allow them to go through. What I think we need to be afraid is running from God. Because I'll tell you what, you'll run right into the hands of the world. And the world will beat you up, the world will chew you up, and the world will spit you out. Our rescue is not in the world. It's in our relationship with Jesus Christ. The righteous runneth unto him. The Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run unto him and find safety. Man, if we're going to run anywhere, let's run into the arms of Jesus. That's this, you know, we, talk, we hear this term, safe place. There is no safe place in this world, only in Christ. And I think the mere fact that people want a safe place, it's indicative that God's put that in their heart. But it's not in the world. It's not hiding from something that, oh, they said something I don't like. Ah, you know. That, that's, what go, that's what's going on in college today. They won't even let Christian speakers on their campuses. Because they can't stand to hear that. Oh, my goodness. It'll make me cry. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's crazy. So give me my little safe place. What happened to good, vigorous debate in colleges? Opposing viewpoints. You know, they shout you down in their ignorance. So he goes on to say in verse, at the end of verse 18, but, but, uh, but fills me with bitterness. Hey, God doesn't fill us with bitterness. God's got blessings you know, for us. You know, bitterness basically springs up when we, the Bible says in, in Hebrews chapter 12, 12, bitterness springs up when we fail to receive the grace of God. It gets a hold of our heart. It, it, it grips the heart. It's like, a, it's like a nasty root. Do you ever notice that you're, you've got the vegetables in your garden, they're producing fruit? Do you ever notice the root system is like this? Do you ever notice that nasty weed and you pull it out, and the root system is like this long. It's like, are you kidding me? And, and all the good stuff that produces fruit, the root system's like that deep. Doesn't take much to, you know, to knock it over. And, and the root of bitterness is like that. It gets deep down, you know, within us. God didn't fill them with bitterness. It, it was, it's our reaction, our response to things. If it is a matter of strength, indeed, He is strong. <clears throat> He say if it's a matter of test, uh, strength and testing me, I'm just a weakling. He's strong. For, for if of justice, who then will appoint my day in court? Who's going to be, who's going to be my witness? You know, or, or and basically, who's going to subpoena God? Or who's going to be my advocate? You know, my attorney. Who's going to be the judge? Uh, though I were righteous, my own mouth would condemn me. <laughs> How true that is. You know, how can anyone justify themselves before, the, for, before a holy God? It's impossible. And that's why sometimes, this is a great verse here, though I were righteous, my own mouth, we have to be careful what we say. And especially Job's friends. I think Job's friends, uh, I, are they listening to this? Because <laughs> they're, they're, they're so absolutely convinced they're righteous, but their own mouth is actually condemning them. And of course, we're going to see that at the end of the book. And though I were blameless, it would prove me perverse. And I am blameless, yet I do not know myself. <clears throat> you know, he doesn't, he doesn't fully understand, you know, all the dynamics. You know, the Bible says we know nothing as we ought to know. Isn't that so true? Isn't that so true? We can so often think we know so much, and yet it's, we're, we're so limited. I am, I am so often surprised how the Lord just shows me sometimes the other side of the coin. 
you know, another, another part of the prism. You know, sometimes truth is like a diamond. And you just sort of turn it and the way the light hits, you know, uh, the different facets of that and reflect in a different kind of way. Um, and we begin to see truth. We see things sometimes differently. Uh, compare yourself now to, I don't know how many years you've walked with the Lord. Compare yourself to what you know now than maybe your first five years, first 10 years of knowing, you know, the Lord and walking with the Lord and, and you know, as a receptacle of truth, what you knew then compared to, you know, how, you, how your experience has tempered you, how it's brought humility, you know, a softening, you know, sometimes, you know, when you look at some young person, uh, they can have some knowledge that can be so, you know, so maybe even articulate with their knowledge. And they can be so right, like my pastor used to say, they can be so right, they're dead right. And, um, and so God, you know, God works over the course of time. He works softness, humility, brokenness. And we learn so much. We, we learn so much from, from our experiences. You know, we can, we, we, we can learn from the experiences of Job. We, we can learn because of the Holy Spirit as he's teaching us through the word of God. We can learn from the experiences of those that have gone before us. One of the things that we learn, to, you know, um, in the Bible is we learn of the terrific dynamics of sin. You know, again, look at, look at David, you know, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the king, the man after God's own heart, the, the shepherd king. He thinks that he can get away with a one-night stand. Man, that thing so spiraled out of control. He probably sat back years later and thought, unbelievable. What, what, a, what a hard lesson that was for David to learn. Never did I think that night I, I, I went over the balcony and I looked down there. Never did I think that I would have murdered somebody. And you know who he murdered? He murdered Uriah. And, it, and, the, and the account goes on to later say, Uriah was one of his mighty men. And I would imagine when he was dealing with the, Uriah, how convicting it must have been because this guy, man, this guy had grit. He had integrity. He wouldn't go, he wouldn't go, you know, sleep with his wife. He wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't, uh, you know, give pleasure to himself because he said, you know, Joab and all my buddies, man, they're fighting in the field and here I am home having a good time. And I imagine it must have been such conviction for David. But David learned through that the dynamics of where one little sin can take us. One little sin. He looked down at Bathsheba. He said, you know, I'm the king. I want that. And he got it all right. He got it with both barrels. So again, we can learn. We can learn and we can learn from David. We can learn from so many others. <clears throat> Now he goes on to say, I despise my life. It is all one thing or another words, it's all the same. Therefore, I say, he destroys the blameless with the wicked. Now, unfortunately, this is an accusation against God, that God's not just. And it's kind of sad that that's happened, that he's saying God's even laughing at innocent victims here uh, as basically, this is what happens sometimes with bitterness. You start to accuse people. You get cynical. I think that's an interesting word, isn't it? Sin, ekol. <laughs> but see, when you get bitter, that's what happens. He laughs at the plight of the innocent. He scourged, the scourge slays suddenly. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of its judges. Is it not he? Or, el or who else could it be? Now, now, certainly, sometimes God will turn over a nation because of their sin, their rebellion. But the fact of the matter is, still, God's not indifferent. You know, you think about maybe a, a, a city. You know, it's interesting. You know, I think, I think Jericho is a perfect example. God deemed to judge and destroy the whole city. But there was one gal there. There was one gal there, Rahab, and she's, you know, her faith and the impact of her faith saved her family. 
And you think about, you know, you think about a, a horrific judgment on a nation or on a city or a war, whatever the case may be. You know what? Certainly God does those things. But you know what? He, he, he's, he sees those that belong to him. And he's able to sort out all those kinds of things. He's not indifferent. He's not harsh. He's not un, unkind. And now my days are swifter than a runner. They flee away. Uh, they see no good. They pass by like swift ships, like an eagle swooping on his prey. And he obviously feels that he is the prey here. And perhaps he just feels his days are coming to an end, are coming to a climax. And if I say, I'll, I'll forget, I will forget my complaint, I'll put off my sad face and wear a smile. I am afraid of all my sufferings. I know that you will not hold me innocent. So again, here he says, even if I stop my complaining, I put on a happy uh, face. All my fears are going to be there. All, their, all my fears are still going to remain, you know, kind of a thing. And the fear is kind of like that. Remember, he says early on, he says, the thing that I have feared has come upon me. And again, fear can be like that. It can sort of just antis anticipate the worst, you know, kind of situation. Whatever, uh, whatever you know, he anticipated uh, and worried about um, that, uh, you know, eventually, in a sense, you know, it, it, you know things came. Um, maybe God was warning him, I don't know. But fear, again, can be very, very debilitating, and it can make us very negative um, about our situation. Okay, where are we here? Verse 29, if I am condemned, why then do I labor in vain? Now, remember Romans chapter 8, it says, who is he who condemns? Is it Christ that died for us? Is, is it he who justifies us? It's the devil. And, and that's the point. He's feeling very condemned. He's getting very beat up. He, he doesn't realize it because he didn't have that privilege, like you and me, of seeing that, reading the first two chapters. And he doesn't realize that he is the target of spiritual warfare. And again, think about the insights that you and I have. And we have to remember that. There's a spiritual realm out there, okay? We're, we're soldiers. The, the, the world, in many respects, is a minefield. Everybody in America wants it to be a playground. And, and look at the wreckage that we have out there in our world. If I wash myself with snow water and cleanse my hands with soap, you will plunge me into the pit, and my own clothes will abhor me. For he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him that we should go to court together. So he's slowly coming to this point, realizing that uh, to hash it out, you know, with God in court would be absolutely a total waste of time. Nor is there any mediator between us. You see, his problem brought him to this revelation. He needs somebody. He needs a mediator. He needs a interceder. He needs someone to reconcile, someone to negotiate. He needs an advocate. He needs a broker. And you know what? The Lord Jesus Christ has done all those things for us. That's why many people's problems and predicament is designed for that, to take them outside of themselves, outside of their convenience or comfort zone, and to find Christ. And to receive in their perplexity, in their problem, perhaps the greatest revelation of their life. Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both and let him take his rod away from me uh, and do not let dread, let dread of him terrify me. It's interesting. All these things have been done for us in Christ. They've all been done for us in Christ. And then I would speak and not fear him. But it is not so with me that is presently. Lord, we praise you. And we thank you, Lord, for the, the revelation of who you are. Lord, as we think of Job, and even as we think of so many people that are, that are lost today and their, their problems, their predicaments, their troubles, Lord, finding you is the solution to it all. And how we pray, Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for us as the church. 
Lord, I pray that we would not be entangled. Lord, controlled by, Lord, our circumstances, our situations. But that, Lord, we would look out and see those that are, so many that are hurting. So many that need you as Savior. So we pray for our country tonight. And we pray for opportunities, Lord. Help us, we pray, Father, to, Lord, to be good counselors. Lord, to have discernment, to have a, a sensitivity. Lord, to be able to, to bring comfort and consolation, to bring truth to people. And Lord, to be able to do it in such a way that we get out of the way. And that, Lord, by bringing truth to people, Lord, they might see you. So, Lord, we love you tonight. And, Lord, we thank you. Thank you that we're able to look at this story from a whole different perspective than Job and his friends, and we can learn from it. So how I pray that you'd help us, how I pray you'd teach us. Strengthen us, we pray, as we seek to honor and live for you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Shall we stand? May the Lord bless you as you go, and may he bless you this week. And I encourage you that if you, if you know any veterans, tomorrow is Veterans Day, maybe a dad, an uncle, a friend, whatever the case may be, uh, send them a message or give them a phone call and let them know that you appreciate them. You appreciate their, their commitment, their sacrifices, um, and that, uh, that, you just, uh, you, that you love them and that you're praying for them. Uh, okay, so God bless you, and uh, we'll see you Sunday.